Guess who's back? It is October 26th, 2020, and you are listening to episode 18 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. If you enjoy the Candid Clarinetist and want to get immediate access to episodes as soon as they are available for download, take a quick second and hit that subscribe button on your podcasting platform of choice. You can find links to all of our content platforms and information about myself and the podcast at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. We have new posts weekly with information about each episode, as well as various links to things like our YouTube channel, as well as our Twitch channel, where we live stream our podcast recordings every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. There's also a bunch of other information and links on the website, including our fantastic discussion with attorney Kevin Case from last week, so make sure to check it out at CandidClarinetistPodcast.com. That is CandidClarinetistPodcast.com. Today's guest is someone who I've wanted to have on the podcast since the onset of this project, as he is one of the finest clarinet players in the world and someone that I've admired for many years. Steve Williamson has been the principal clarinet of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra since 2011, having also held the same position with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and the New York Philharmonic. Steve, it is such an honor to have you on the show. Oh, so happy to be here, Sam. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, So I wanted to bring you on to talk about uh, this concept and this idea of projection. And I think that it's sort of a um, sort of pie in the sky idea because nobody can really define what it means to project as an instrumentalist or a clarinetist. So can you just take a minute to sort of define projection as it pertains to playing an instrument and clarinet specifically? Well, I think you know, I think as a wind player, um, what's difficult about learning how to project? I mean, I think anything can be loud. I think you can you can have a very very loud sound, but it may not give you the best qualities that you want an audience to hear. So I think one of the things that I um, started, I, I mean, I would say, just before I won the Met, I was always battling this. I, I used to play buffets for a very very long time, and um, I kept finding that when I needed to project as much as I could, sometimes I would just hit this plateau. Like I'd I'd hit this moment where the sound would begin to either spread or my tone would get too bright. And it was, I kept, I kept adjusting the resistance in my mouthpiece. So I would, I would uh, get, I would start to play stronger and stronger reads. Um, I'd experiment with ligature. Everybody experiments with ligatures and barrels and mouthpieces and stuff it, it, it can it can it can be a bottomless pit yes, uh, it can be just you know uh, of negative return sometimes when it really clicked though i think what happened for me was that i think i had reached the limitations of how much air i was putting into the instrument i play with a with a substantial amount of air and i think i just kept building building more strength in, in the amount of air that I would use. So there was a point where the instrument just wouldn't hold it anymore. And then I, I met, uh, two fantastic clarinetists, uh, who I'm sure everybody knows, uh, uh, Ricardo Morales and Todd Levy Mm -hmm. in New York. I was just getting out of, well, I wasn't just, I was about in my fifth, four, four years. Let's see. I graduated from my master's in 95. Yeah. So about four years. So it was around 99. I met Ricardo and Todd Levy and they had just started playing on these Selmer signature clarinets. Now we all know Ricardo's played almost on everything. He can play, he can play everything. And, and, and so can Todd, but I, you know, they, they took an interest in me, uh, my playing and they, they were encouraging me to come sub with them and, and, you know, basically be a second clarinetist to, to both of them in, in their uh, in the orchestras that they played in, uh, whether it was the Met or whether it was um, a, a fantastic ensemble at the time that Todd was playing in called EOS. EOS Orchestra, great, great 
some of the best freelancers in New York. So uh, I, I, I said, well, I better try this instrument. And I tried it and it felt so resistant and it felt almost, for me, and, and I felt the pitch was really great, but the sound was kind of dull. So I'm like, well, what's going on with this? Uh, they, they don't sound that way. And they both said, well, try to, try to play with as much air as you possibly can and see what happens. Well, what it meant was I, I still needed to get stronger to play this instrument. It is inherently a very resistant instrument. So I was like, okay, I'll keep trying. And then they said, and do not pull your, your tried and true buffet out. You got to pack that thing up and send it to another zip code. <laughs> because if you go back and forth, the amount of air and the type of air that I would use when I played on my buffet was maybe a more relaxed, a little bit wider. You know, it's true what they what they say that you can relax into the sound of a buffet and then it sounds really, really just gorgeous. And this is completely the polar opposite. This is not that a, it's not a hernia generator, but what it <laughs> ended up meaning for me was that, well, I guess I have I can trust this instrument enough that it's it's not going to spread on me. It's going to hold everything that I give it and it's going to take everything I give and it's going to send it out. And usually, as I found, it sent out the best qualities of, of what I thought the clarinet should sound like. So equipment was a big thing for me. But what I found, then I, when I won the Met, uh, after Ricardo left, I, 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 I started to then have another challenge because, you know, those are tough shoes to fill. You have to come in after someone like Ricardo Morales, who has an endless amount of resonance in his sound and it's always rich it's always beautiful it's never strident and i'm like oh my god uh whenever i was performing under james levine he would he would always like motion to me more more and more and i, I began to go because at that time i was playing on strength four reeds i played traditional box blue van Doren's, and it was at that moment that i switched to going to fives and i was like and once I switched, Maestro Levine was smiling all the time, and he, I, he, he never even looked. He never even gave me anything but a smile from that moment. So I felt like, okay, I finally figured it out. And it's, and and I've also tried Ricardo's setup, which is extraordinarily resistant, at least at the time it was. So it was a real eye and ear opener for me whenever you're playing, say, a Wagner opera, and it says piano dolce, and it's a solo line in the clarinet that has to soar over the strings, uh, you're literally playing mezzo forte or forte. There's just no way around it. So what ended up happening is I began to learn how to play with this resistance. And as you do with most strength training, you develop a stamina. And I began to take less and less frequent breaths. So I started to develop the stamina. And and from that moment on, I felt like I feel like that's what helped develop my my tonal concept of playing in an orchestra. So it didn't matter whether I was in the lowest register of the clarinet. I obviously, I find that the lowest register of the clarinet is the most important part of the instrument. I think everything uh, comes from that shallow register. All the overtones are based on your lowest register of playing. And if you can have a deep, rich sound in the low register, I think everything else is going to sound great. But it, it, it took a lot of work. I mean, yeah. anybody, anybody who sits next to me knows, okay, you know, Steve better have his uh, handkerchief out because I, I, I perspire a lot when I play because it's like, it's like a workout for me whenever I play. So, but as long as it sounds good, I'm happy because that's, that's the end result. I mean, I don't care if somebody plays upside down underwater, um, you know, with a, you know, an aluminum reed. If it sounds good, it's good. And um, the, it's an, it, to me, it's an oral art form. So if, if it sounds beautiful, I love it. So, yeah. you know, it works for me. It is hard work. Um, but I, I don't, you know, obviously I feel extraordinarily lucky to have played in the orchestras that I have. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So you mentioned a couple of things there. So the, uh, the Selmer signature clarinets, uh, I know I've tried those instruments. I'm a buffet artist, so I, I play on buffets. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if I didn't play on buffets, that's the, the absolute first thing I'd reach for. 
Um, just uh, not just because of the people that play them, but uh, when I've tried them, they feel comfortable. And and I know what you're talking about. Which like the more you give, I think. Uh, well, I'll get into this story a little later, but I think with that instrument, particularly, the more you give, the more it gives back to you. I don't know if you feel the same way about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I, you know, inter interestingly, when I first played it, I thought my sound was really small. And I thought, oh, my God, uh, how are these guys sounding so big on their instruments? But it really was an issue of how you use your air. And that's why I had to really um, trust the training process. So I didn't really truly feel comfortable on that instrument. It took me about almost a year and a half. And they were always very, uh, meaning Ricardo and Todd were also so uh, accommodating and encouraging and just kept saying, you're getting there, you're getting there, keep going, keep going. And uh, so it was, um, you know, it was a team effort. But I think with that instrument, because I've played recitals, I've played all the other types of uh, Selmer instruments. I've played, of course, all the buffet instruments that have come out. Um, and, and, and some lean towards each other, but I think the one that is so distinctively in its own, it's, it's just its own entity is the signature. It's not like any other instrument. So it's like you either love it or you hate it. And I think for me, it was one of those things where, um, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So I was like, really like, okay, I'm going to. I'm not going to let you play me. I'm going to learn to play you and we're going to make this work. And literally, I swear, it was the craziest thing. Once I switched to that instrument uh, within that year and a half, then every audition I took was just like, boom, I, I didn't. Because one thing that really transformed the not just the audition process, but the way I play the clarinet, I, I don't worry about intonation anymore. I don't think about it. It's so it's actually so, especially if you play with a fixed pitch in instrument, it's unbelievably in tune. So I learned how to adjust to more out of tune instruments to, to, you know, cause you have to, you have to be able to be very flexible to get that flexibility. You had to develop your air strength. And once I got that, it was just like, I could just play the music for music's sake. I didn't have to worry about technical aspects of the clarinet that in the past would have sort of slowed me down a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Todd uh, Levy. So Todd, I, I'm so thankful and fortunate for him. He, he's actually the person who sort of gave me my first opportunity in the professional world when, uh, you know, with the Milwaukee Symphony. And so I, I played second to him a number of times. I've never had the privilege of, of playing second next to you. Um, but That'll happen. That'll uh, happen. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but with, with Todd, I, I remember the first time I sat next to him in the section with him and I heard him play, I, I, I got it in terms of the amount, like, because what it sounds like when you're next to the person and what it sounds like in the back of the hall are two completely different things. Definitely. And, and I think when I sat next to Todd, I was like, okay, this is a very accomplished player, um, you know, someone I strive to be like one day. And what he's doing here is not what I've been doing for the last 20 years or whatever. Uh, at that point, it wasn't 20 years, but um, sure. you know what I mean? And so yeah. like, it made me really rethink everything in terms of my equipment, because I always use really soft stuff. And mm -hmm. now, you know, when people try my equipment, they're like, whoa, I can barely make a sound on it. And I'm like, yeah, you, you got to, <laughs> eventually you have to understand that, that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, basically it's a little bit different, but. Um, for sure, but, for sure. But uh, yeah, that, that was a really interesting experience for me. And I encourage everybody, uh, you know, Listen to your teachers, especially if your teachers play in orchestras and play principal clarinet. Listen to the the way that they create the sound and 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 how hard they're working to create that sound. And that's take that and multiply it by like ten because they're not <laughs> playing in an orchestra in your lesson. You know what I mean? And and so I, I I mean I don't know if I'm giving great advice here, but I think that like that's you know em emulating that or at least striving for that is is really critically important. It's true. I, I, I had the privilege when I was, uh, I did a Fulbright in Berlin for years 91 through 93, so two years. And during that time, I mean, I had the, the, the great privilege of, of, of listening to the Berlin Philharmonic, being able to be up on stage while they rehearsed. It was an amazing moment for me. But one of the greatest experiences was my my prominent teacher was a man named Peter Rikoff, um, who passed away, unfortunately, but 
he could not play the French system. So he only played the German system. He didn't speak English. So I, of course, I had to learn German uh, as proficiently as I could. Um, but, you know, the, the great thing about being a musician is that um, sometimes, most of the time, um, the art of, of making music speaks for itself. So he would ask me, like, at the time I was studying with him, he didn't even have his instrument out. He would take your instrument and then demonstrate. But he would always ask me, what's the fingering for this note or that <laughs> note? And I'd show him. And, and it didn't even matter if he actually hit the notes that he was supposed to play. The amount of depth in his sound, um, whenever he would play my instrument, I just would just put my head down in shame. I would be like, oh, my God, I am not even coming close. So you're absolutely right. Uh, he was a great orchestral player as well as a, a soloist and chamber musician. So I feel like, you know, there is there is something to be said about uh, the depth of sound that, and I really mean it with, with con especially contemporary orchestras today, because let's be honest, most of the halls that our orchestras play in, especially in the States, aren't very good. I mean, unless you're in Severance Hall or Symphony Hall in, in, in Boston, um, I mean, in my opinion, or Carnegie, uh, those are the three. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got some you know, B levels, and then you got a lot of D levels. <laughs> and as much as I love playing in the Chicago Symphony, our hall is not a great hall at all. It is a very dead, 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 dead dry hall. Yeah. So I think what happened for me personally is that the way I developed my sound at the Met, it was the perfect, it was the perfect um, tonal test and a development for me to to step into the both the New York Philharmonic and the Chicago Symphony, and that that was never a question of my sound. It was never a question of my ability to project in the hall. And for most people taking those auditions, it was an issue of their sound and would that actually muster up with the other players on stage. So I think that that. I mean, I I, I give so much credit to the time I had at the Met. I mean, it was about ten years and. That was just, and it was a lot of playing, and it was a lot of stamina and endurance training, but it was some of the, and I, I will always love the operatic repertoire. It's some of the greatest music, period. Yeah, I absolutely. think, I do think that the clarinet is, whether I say this selfishly or not, I do think that the clarinet is the absolute primary um, wind player in, in the orchestra. Not mm -hmm. the oboe, not the flute, not the bassoon, but certainly the clarinet has the most solo soloistic moments. Period, and um, is a, it was a great learning experience to lead from that chair. Yeah. So you brought up uh, the concert halls, which is I think a, I think you have really one of the more unique perspectives on this because you did you played in the Met and then you played in New York and Chicago and I. Obviously, New York and Chicago don't have the greatest reputations in terms of the concert halls. The orchestras are fantastic, but the concert halls um, have always been kind of a, a thing with them. Uh, I mean, they're historic and beautiful, but acoustically, I know it's uh, musicians tend to speak a little bit unfavorably about them. So can you say, uh, or can you tell us, um, do, do you think that uh, you had to do anything different uh, when you translated from those different halls or when you go on tour? You know, you visit all the beautiful halls in Europe or, mm -hmm. you know, the western side of the United States or whatever. Uh, do you have to do anything different for each different concert hall? Yes, for sure. I will say this. Um, of the three halls, whether it's David Geffen or, or the Met Opera or, um, you know, Orchestra Hall in, in Chicago, Orchestra Hall in Chicago is by far the most difficult hall to play in. Um especially for the way that it feels when you're on stage. Um, it's So it's, first of all, it's extremely dry. You hear nothing come back to you. Whatever you, you, whatever you could hear is the only time that you might hear something come back and it's very faint is when there's no one in the hall. So that doesn't do you much good. Once the hall is filled up, it becomes even deader and drier. And I'll say that, you know, in... In comparison, the the Met Opera, um, the pit at the Met Opera is is divine. You can do anything in that hall, 
without barely trying. I mean, I can play so softly and I know that that carries, and that's a 4,000 seat hall. That goes, I know it goes all the way to the back. So the hall is extraordinarily helpful in regard to that. But um, depending on the repertoire that you play and the conductor, so James Levine loved to have the string sound. Uh, he wanted every single violinist to play like they were the concert master. So everything was just to the fore in a Mozart opera. It's like you might as well have two or three people doubling, tripling your part in order to have enough presence over that string sound. But that's what he wanted you to do. He wanted you to play with so much presence without any edge. So it always had to be rich and beautiful and sonorous and just float over the top of the orchestra. So that was great. But, you know, generally, if I was just warming up in that in that hall by myself, I mean, I I didn't have to work that hard. Um, David Geffen is sort of in the middle of those two. David Geffen feels really good for me on stage. Mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable on stage. But you get about five seats out into the hall and it's like a giant curtain. And they did a test, you know, um, several members of the orchestra did test to see how much resonance is actually going out into the hall. And about, I think somebody said basically, which is the sweet spot, everybody says seventh row center. Mm -hmm. um, you had 50% of the sound that was coming off the stage. Okay. Only 50%. And then as you split that distance and went further and further back, it would, it would, it would be cut in half. So if you were up in the back of the hall, you were getting 5% of the sound of the orchestra, wow. nothing, nothing carried. So I think it's that in that respect, it's better in orchestra hall in, in Chicago, because I do think people can hear, but I'll, I'll say this, it's because we're, we, you, we each individually bring an immense amount of resonance to the hall. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I can, I can't just, I just can't coast. I'm constantly giving, 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 giving. I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not forcing my sound. And that's the difference. When you don't hear anything come back, your natural tendency is to want to force the sound so that you can get something to come back. When you do that, your sound actually gets smaller and thinner. And so you have to trust your inherent resonance that you, you know, you know, when you play with a deep, rich sound, you've got to trust that that's what's going off the stage and, and, but you don't hear it. So that's, it's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a real test in trust in your own ability uh, to make a, a really good sound. But yeah, so those three halls, very, very different. Each have their, um, I mean, on, for me, the mat was just, just so beautiful and easy to play in. And you could hear across the entire pit. You could hear up on stage. You could hear everything. And it tended to just make your sound beautiful. It only made it better. Yeah. But uh, the, other, the other hall is not so much. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, with the Met, um, this is just for my own uh, information, but what was the seating arrangement like in the Met? Was it like an actual orchestra, or did you guys put the winds to the side? Or like, what, what was the configuration? Uh, typically, it was like a t typical symphonic orchestra. We, uh, meaning the, the flutes and oboes and clarinets and bassoons, would be right in the center, uh, but closer to, to the prompter's box. So the bassoon, first bassoon and first clarinet would be right in front of the prompter's box at the, it's, you know, the front of the stage. Yeah. Um, if, if we had more than say four clarinets, even sometimes five, we would still be in that formation. But say if we did Electra where there's like eight or nine clarinets and, and, and Bassett clarinets, or basset horns, you, you, we would end up being off to the side, meaning to the the right side of the conductor. Okay. Um, and then we'd be where the rest of the horns would be and the brass, we would just all be on that side. Um, but typically, really that only happened in, in either Electra or Salome, uh, may, maybe Rite of Spring. Yes, Rite of Spring, we would be off to the side as well, just because of the sheer forces that yeah. you, we'd be playing with. But in, in um, you know, Getter Dameron, when there's, you know, I don't know how many harps, five, oh, six yeah. harps. Yeah, right. We're still in that same position. They would just move, they just sort of move the string section out of the harp's way. Um, but we would typically stay right there in front of the prompter's box most of the time. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, and 
for those people uh, who haven't been to any of these halls, I'd say, and you could probably speak better better this than I could, but uh, Symphony Hall is, is very vertical just because of kind of how it's, it's like right in the middle of a city block. It's kind of strange. It's like, I mean, it's not strange. Mm-hmm. It's really cool, but it's like smack dab in the middle of a downtown city block. And so it's more yeah, vertical. Yeah, you kind of blink and you blink and you miss it. Right. It's weird. Right. I remember when I first was trying to find the hall for the audition, I, I didn't, I couldn't believe where it was. I'm like, right. wait, it's in the middle of this block. It, it's not the whole block, yeah. but uh, definitely interesting. And then David Geffen is more of like the shoebox kind of style, if I'm not correct, where there's a big yes. floor, um, lots of seats on the floor, and then sort of the vertical boxes. And then a Met is like, the Met's kind of like a combo. It's sort of, it's a little deeper, I'd say, probably than Symphony Hall, but then the, the, the balconies are deeper as well. So it's not as exactly. straight up and down to Chicago. So, and really, they, and they go all the way around. I mean, they wrap right. around uh, to the front of the stage. Yeah. So really interesting to 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 hear how acoustically the four thousand seat hall is the most uh, rewarding and easiest to play. Absolutely, and that's crazy. Absolutely, you would go up to the family circle, which is just like in the nosebleed section. And for me, um, that's where I really wanted to hear the orchestra perform. I mean, that's where I would go to hear operas on my nights off. It would be up in the family circle. Because, um, I mean, it's a sign of a great hall where the, the further you go, the better it gets. Yep. I mean, that's, that's truly like what Carnegie is like, and that's what Severance Hall is like, and that's what Symphony Hall in Boston is like. It, there, there are no real bad seats. Uh, it's whether you have a visual obstruction or not. but audibly fantastic all the way um i you know believe me they've tried to do i think everything they can do to our hall over the many 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 years with renovations and um you know what ends up happening because you mentioned you know how does how does it feel like to play in the halls in europe and and even in japan like uh, in sapporo or or um suntory hall yeah. these incredible halls where like i said at the met or you know Carnegie, you feel like you can do anything. What ends up happening is that we we have worked so hard to sound our best in Orchestra Hall in Chicago that wherever else I've gone, I just basically scale it all back. I mean, I, I don't work as hard. I'm able to actually be less fatigued. Um, you know, a, a two hour concert will go by and it'll feel like 15 minutes for me compared to what I do in, in Orchestra Hall. So it's touring is so much fun yeah, right. <laughs> we love it because not only do we sound really i think we sound our best on tour because the halls are so forgiving and actually allow you to do what they're supposed to do which is enjoy the resonance of the hall rather than we bring the resonance to the hall so we scale back pretty much all the time and especially i mean i'm sure it wasn't that way under schulte he just let let everybody let loose especially mm-hmm. the brass but under maestro muti he's really about refinement of sound and he wants you know he wants the softest softs and the louds can be loud when they need to be but they always have to be beautiful it's never about an edgy you know over one section overpowering others it's always this collaboration of unity from the front of the stage to the back and that's what i really have enjoyed with him immensely yeah very cool so as far as uh, obviously you've played at the the highest level in opera orchestra and symphony orchestra do you think there's any difference between it in terms of how you play or is it mainly just repertoire and you're just adjusting for different things yeah, you know, I, I, I used to answer this question differently. I said, well, you know, in an opera orchestra, you really always, and it is true, you, unless it's just an orchestral interlude, you're always accompanying the singers. Singers are foremost the main event. But the more I think about it, um, especially with that orchestra, um, the Met, um, it, is, it is truly chamber music in, in its highest form. Uh, I remember it was, it was stunning to me because the, whenever you would place, play a performance, it could, and it didn't even have to be a substantial clarinet part. It could be anything, but I know what would end up happening is that there would be people that would come up and especially, especially the former principal timpanist of the orchestra who had been in the orchestra for 63 years. I mean, he was, mm-hmm. 
he was 90 something by the time he passed away. But and he, he stayed in that orchestra literally until his dying day. And he would come up to me all the time and he'd say, you know, I noticed in this whole note you were playing in the middle of like this gigantic orchestral tutti that you, you kind of did this like rise and fall of the line. I thought that was really lovely. I was, I was like, I've got a timpanist on the other side of the orchestra <laughs> coming over and telling me how I played a whole note. It was so, it was so invigorating and I was so flattered that, that people listen that well in an orchestra like that. And it only proves that, you know, great musicians, you know, birds of a feather flock together because it, it's some of the nicest people I've ever performed with. They're like a family. Um, and for me, the only other orchestra that really embodied that for me was here in Chicago, where you feel like everybody's got your back. You could be having not your best day, but guess what? Your, 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 your section and your colleagues around you are all going to make you rise to a higher level of playing. And hopefully I do that for my colleagues as well. I mean, I, I felt that both at the Met and in Chicago, and it was, it, it's one of the main reasons why I'm, I'm here for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's really, that's really cool. Um, so you talked about a little bit about your equipment already. So you play on the signature clarinets, you play on traditional five reeds. Uh, yep. and so what, uh, what rounds out your, so mouthpiece and, and ligature and any other, uh, doohickeys you got in there? Yeah. <laughs> or doodads, I mean, it's whatever. Pretty doodads. Yeah, I know. I'll tell you, um, I play, I've, um, since I was a junior at Eastman, studying with Ken Grant. Um, he was the first person, per, first person to push me. I played on a Van Doren Fiverr V Lyre. Mm -hmm. That's all I played on through high school. And I, you know, I remember hearing, oh, this is what Marcellus and, you know, if you're going to play a Van Doren mouthpiece, this Marcellus was giving it the stamp of approval. So, I mean, I was like, wow. Okay. So, and it was great. Like it, it had really great intonation. Um, but it's super close facing. I mean, but it, it worked really well for me. Well, once I started studying with Ken, um, he was pushing the envelope with me to get more sound, more resonance, richer tone. Let's go. No, no, you could do more than that. And then I, you know, I was, I basically was just overpowering this mouthpiece. Well, then he, he pulled out a very, very special, I mean, he pulled out several pine mouthpieces, uh, which is what he was playing on at the time. But there was one that he had made for him. Uh, that I think he told me took 12 hours of time with him and Jim Pine. Um, may he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, he just recently passed away. Uh, but that mouthpiece was so resistant for me. I remember he said, you've got to play this on your, on, on your uh, junior recital. And I'm like, how? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just like, I'm out of breath by the time I play like three or four notes. He said, but you, I, you got to trust me. He's like, that sound is so special and it sounds so great. And he was so generous. He, he gave me this mouthpiece with the complete trust that I would do the work. And, and then I played that mouthpiece, oh gosh, for maybe seven or eight years after that, and maybe even 10, I don't even remember. And from that moment on, I was just playing pine mouthpieces. The next pine mouthpiece I got was a BC, and that's what I won the Met on. Um, in my first year at the Met, I, like I said, I was having difficulty getting even a bigger, richer sound that would project even more. Um, and then I met up with Jim, and we found a JXBC, and that was like, that changed my life. Mm -hmm. Then everything from that moment on, that's... That's when I, I was able to switch to fives even, which he didn't think was possible. But I said, yeah, for some reason, I'm, it's really working. And then that was the goal was, could I get a backup mouthpiece that does what this one does? Because I can't play on this one forever. It's going to change. Right. And I knew it was starting to change on me. Um, so for literally something between eight or nine or maybe even 10 years, Jim Pine and I worked so closely tirelessly to find the next best thing. Oops, I'm at a loss, Steve, here. Yeah. 
then we ended up calling that Ray, uh, playing on a pine. It's you know, it's a, uh, it's an acquired taste. I mean, I think most people love the sound, but hey, it's, Steve, it's sorry to interrupt. It can be difficult. Uh, sorry yes. to interrupt. I, I lost you a little bit there. So can you back up oh. to um, you were talking about you were trying to find the next best thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, you just uh, bugged that a little bit. Oh, no worries. I'm glad you told me. Yeah. So, yeah, I was trying to find the next best thing. Um, and it took me, it took Jim and I between eight to 10 years to find what we were trying to find was just a duplicate or a copy. But Jim being Jim, he wanted not just a copy, he wanted something better. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, I know there's something better out there than what you have. And we're going to find it. And he was, he was relentless. But I, you know, I trusted him and I'm so grateful that I did because we ended up making a, a Williamson model that I was so happy with and have been now. I play it for the past three years and um, same read, same everything. So I, I, I instead of finding um, a read to go with a mouthpiece, we wanted to find a mouthpiece that goes with my read. And, gotcha. and he had never done that before. And I thought that was pretty cool because I have a really consistent way of, of working on my reads and I, because of that, not only do they last really long, but they, they, they hardly change. It doesn't matter what the weather does or where I go, you know, elevation or not. Uh, it really is great. So for me, it was the best, it was the best compromise. Uh, he found something that I, I will, and I have many of them now. So I have many, many Williamson mouthpieces that I am happy to rotate. So I'm going to, I, Knock on wood, I should be fine for the rest of my career. Yeah, you got to store um, those in a vault somewhere. Make sure nobody exactly, gets them. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, I do know this much. Um, uh, even though Jim has passed, uh, and we will miss him so much, his lovely wife Kyle has been working with him for, gosh, I, I mean, ever since they've been together. So for years and years and years, she's been right there working with him on these mouthpieces. So she is going to continue the, the, the production of the pine mouthpiece and nobody knows it better than her. So I, I'm really confident and, and I'm really grateful that we'll be working together um, to keep promoting such great, great mouthpieces that, I mean, also for me, I, I can't, there's, I could play another mouthpiece, but I don't want to because yeah. it does, doesn't give me what I want. Uh, you asked about ligature, mm-hmm. so basic. Uh, you know, there's so many out there, right? Yeah. And the crazy thing is, I've always felt this way. If you have a great read, you can play anything. If you have a great read and great mouthpiece, you can definitely play everything. But the thing that I've always found that you have to have a great read is a bonad ligature. And I use a nickel-plated inverted bonad. And ever since I've done that, it's just, it just seems to pull everything together. I get the the best articulation I can. And I also feel like I have uh, such. Um, I can play so softly, and, and and I can play as loud as I want without the uh, without the spreading, and that for me has just been great. And it's it's embarrassing. I mean, those those ligatures cost like fifteen bucks or something, <laughs> right? Hey, if it ain't break, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? That, that's right. So yeah. I mean, I and I, I you know I think a lot of people don't know how to use the bonad ligature. So it's it's there is a molding process of how you bend the mouthpiece to to really form fit to your bend the ligature so it form fits to the mouthpiece and when when you know how to do that it's really simple once you do that it, it all of a sudden the sound just pops right out and you're like oh my god yeah mm-hmm. we've got it now i always use a bg eight millimeter thick bass clarinet patch on my mouthpiece not the clarinet ones because i find that i don't get enough seal with that but the bass clarinet patch is what i've always used and I guess, I mean, I'm not, I'm not one of those non-biters. I am a biter for sure. And maybe that's why I use the patch. It's just to keep me in check. I don't want to cut off the sound. I want to embrace it, but, um, it is resistant. And I just don't think I could play it if I didn't have a little, uh, musculature, uh, force going on. So that's, that's what I do. That's cool. what I do. That's great. That's awesome. And, and, and I'm super 
envious because I, I have always been interested in creating some piece of equipment or something. So the fact that you have your own mouthpiece, I'm a little, I'm a little green right now because I, I want to, I want to, I want to do that. I want to make my own mouthpiece or ligature. So yeah, I just need do to find it. the right, uh, the right person. Cause I can't, obviously I don't know anything about it. Other, I know how it feels and how it plays, but I don't know how to actually do it. So, you know, there are so many great mouthpiece makers out there today. I mean, I know Brad Bain does amazing work and, um, Oh gosh, Ramon Wachowski does incredible work, um, not just with his own mouthpiece, but re refacing. So I mean, like you guys mm -hmm. could start with something from scratch and and find something together. Yeah, I mean, I th I do think it's tough. I think people um, in, in general who uh, have to go from bass clarinet to clarinet, I think that's harder than going from E flat clarinet to clarinet. I think there's less of a an adjustment uh, in the soprano world than going to bass clarinet, and so I always find um, that bass clarinetists that I know and, and love and respect, obviously your former teacher, Lori, Lori Bloom, and, and, um, one of my dear colleagues, uh, from the Met, Jim Anyabaney, they they had a way of, of playing on the bass clarinet that felt the, an equal amount of resistance that they had on the B flat or A clarinet. So uh, to find something that is similar when you go back and forth, so you're not, you know, fishing around when you go from one to the other. So that that's probably also something that you'd want to, if you're going to make a clarinet mouthpiece, you, you might as well make a bass clarinet mouthpiece right. too. That's my opinion. I, I think there's always room for improvement in all of those areas. Right, absolutely. And I know one of, uh, well, we're on a little bit of a tangent now, but I know one of Lori's things was always, he wanted to make it make the bass clarinet feel the most like a clarinet, just a little bit bigger. And so like uh perfectly candid uh from me i i i don't practice bass clarinet all that often because i just use if i want to get better at bass clarinet i know that if i practice clarinet i'm getting better at bass clarinet and so i well, just try to you know transitively do that go ahead sorry i can't speak for for lori but i mean it always seemed like his clarinet playing was on on par with his bass clarinet playing he was yeah. always just t I, you know top notch constantly and he also did so much you know, like he did so many chamber he had so many ch chamber performances and solo performances on clarinet i mean i mean uh he 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 pushed the envelope for sure so i mean yeah it's i gotta say it's a big thrill to be in this orchestra where there's so many i mean you've got john john brucier you got greg smith you got lori bloom i mean these guys are are iconic and not just the, you know, you, uh, the bass clarinet or the E flat clarinet, but all across the board on clarinet playing, they're amazing players and Absolutely. really great musicians. Yeah, so. tit titans of the clarinet world for sure. For and, sure. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a, what a, what a great section. Um, so y you mentioned chamber music, so let's just dive into this. I, I I'm just curious. Obviously, you've made most of your career as an orchestral player. Um, well, if you had your choice, what would be your sort of preferred medium for music making? Like, do you like chamber music? Do you like solo repertoire? Do you like concertos? What, what's your What's your favorite? You know, I, gosh, when I was really young, I thought all I wanted to do was be a soloist. So I always wanted to be a, con, you know, concertizing all the time, standing up there with the spotlight. But you know, I have to say it's different for me uh, now. I, I feel that there's just so much more collaborative music making and chamber music. I, I love it so much more. I feel, I don't know, I'd rather be a part of something bigger than just myself. And I think it would be a lot more interesting than just myself. So I think um, playing uh, chamber music <clears throat> and, and even, I have to say, I mean, I, I don't think I could survive if I wasn't playing in the orchestra, but I do think that I was very blessed uh, when I started my freshman year at Eastman I formed a, a woodwind quintet um, that ended up winning several big competitions. Uh, we won uh, the Coleman competition out in California, and then we we won the Concert Artist Guild competition in New York. And my wife is the horn player, <laughs> so at that time it was it was. It, maybe secretively was an opportunity for me to get to date this great horn player <laughs> who I was really fond of. But the other members of the quintet um, were all girls and they're all wonderful 
really unbelievable musicians and and dear friends and we never changed the personnel of the group this group has been had been together for maybe 26 years and we played all over the world we traveled um i mean we we played everything from you know from nursing homes to you know great uh, beautiful big halls uh in south america and in europe and and in the states we were very very lucky and we had a residency with National Public Radio for one week on performance today. It was such, and that's really like, so I never did any orchestral seminars. I never did summer festivals that involved orchestral playing because I wasn't even considering being an orchestral player. That was really never on my agenda. It was always about being in this woodwind quintet. Like mm -hmm. that was it for me. So my woodwind quintet playing um, was one of the major highlights of chamber music for me, for sure. Cool. And apparently we're, 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 we're slated to get back together again next summer, which I'm really excited about. Oh, amazing. Um, a, yeah. yeah. There was a festival we started. Um, it's been now, it's about to be its 25th year. So that's why they've invited us back. But we spent 10 years in Houston, Texas in the, in the God forsaken heat <laughs> uh, for 10, 10 weeks every summer. And uh, we would tr travel and tour, but we were based out of Houston and that was called the American festival for the arts. Um, and they've really grown. I mean, they have like 3,000 students. It's an all-year thing. Um, so it's a, they've asked us to come back and play um, uh, as a featured artist. And we're, I, I really hope it, we can do it. It'll be around like the 4th of July time next year. I hope, God willing, everybody will be safe and we can do these things. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. That'll be a great reunion. That'll be really yeah, fun for you to go back sure. to, uh, to to the Woodwind Quintet. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, getting back to the orchestra thing, I always think it's interesting, uh, and different people have different perspectives on this, but uh, what do you view as sort of the role of the principal clarinet in the woodwind, what I call the woodwind hierarchy? So, you know, the, the oboe, flute, bassoon, clarinet. And I know people have different ideas of the balance or whatever, but how do you view the role of the clarinet? You know, I mean, the role, I, I think, I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't think that one is more important than the other. I feel like all four wind players um, have equal amount of, uh, what would the word be, uh, leverage or musical... Um, <sighs> Uh, musical ideas to bring to the table. Uh, and I think what's really special is if you have really great musicians around you, um, I think the great thing about, and I, have, I even say this, like it's, yes, as a principal player, like when a decision has to be made, it usually is deferred to the principal player. They're like, you know what, I, we're not coming to an, a, an agreement, so we're just going to do this. Sometimes you just don't have the time and you may have two or three rehearsals or two rehearsals and then a dress rehearsal. You don't really have time to um, get into deep discussions, although there have, you know, I know that the, there have been times where, you know, after a rehearsal, we'll, we'll want to touch something up or, you know, I'll get a phone call late at night from one of my colleagues saying, you know, I really wonder about this. Could we try this again tomorrow? Fine. I think what's amazing is that if everybody um, comes to the table as if, if something isn't right and something isn't working, I think great musicians usually look at themselves first as the problem. And I know that I do this every single time. It's not even a psychological, um, I'm not doing it to prove a point. I'm not trying to be a martyr. I just do believe that when something isn't right, I always want to look at myself first before I address someone else uh, with the possible idea that maybe we should try something here. But I usually put the blame on myself first if something isn't working. And I think all of us do that. That's what I love about the orchestra, at least uh, for us in Chicago. Everybody is the first to think, hmm, I, maybe I should try this in order to make this work. Before we actually start discussing something, we talk, um, you know, you don't have much time, but w we do make an effort to really, you know, I think when you're having a run through, like a very first rehearsal, there's not that much talking going on. It's usually by the second rehearsal when we start discussing if the same thing happened again, then we know, OK, that hasn't been addressed and we really should come to a decision. Um, mm -hmm. But I have such respect for my colleagues that um, if somebody really is feeling 
passionate about this phrase going this way and I, I and may not be my cup of tea, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. I'm totally going to, because I respect them. And I, I feel like we all, we all bring something unique to the table. So I, I hate the idea of hierarchy. Some people, like I just said, well, I think the clarinet's the most important thing in opera, but the truth is yeah. everybody, I mean, I say that just because I just love the solos that the clarinet has in the opera world. But you know, the oboe typically is the leader of the wind section in an orchestra just by the, you know, the history of symphonic playing, whether it's here in America or in Europe or anywhere else, not just because they give the tuning a, but I think by default, somebody who's in front of me, um, I'm more inclined to follow them than for them to follow me, whether that's just physically or, or orally, I think it's important to know that, um, for us to actually be more connected, I'm more inclined to follow the people in front of me. If I don't agree with what's going on, I'll I'll ask, could we try something? But it, when it's time for a performance and it and something goes awry, I'm going with whatever whatever happens in front of me. Right. I'm exactly. not I'm not going to lead the orchestra from the back, and I don't think anybody should. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, I I really like what you said, where uh, if something is not right, you look at yourself for, first. And I always you know like to tell students. Uh, when I get the opportunity, I don't teach all that much, but when I got the opportunity, I, I always like to say, make sure you point your thumb before you start pointing your finger. And just because there's always something that you can be doing better, you know, always. there's always something that you can be contributing. Maybe I can help this person out by doing this or whatever the case is. And so I, I really like that you said that. And coming from you, it's really powerful because a lot of people look at people like you and it's like, oh, he's amazing and he doesn't need to do anything else it's like no we're, oh we're, we're, we're all improving you know we're all just learning oh my gosh yeah. forget it i make more mistakes than probably most people i know but the truth is when it comes down to it i mean i i want to always hold myself accountable so i'm constantly i mean whatever I, I tell my students this all the time and i really believe it's like i think it's the reason why we do what we do it's not it's not to um it's not the accolades and after a while, I can tell you, it's not about the praise. What it is, is I want to be better tomorrow than I was today. And I'm constantly pushing the envelope because whatever I just did, yeah, it's not like I'm whipping myself at night before I go to bed. Like, oh my God, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But I do believe like, well, you know what, tomorrow, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing something extra special. And I just constantly want to do that every day I can because it's not just, um, raising the bar for myself. It's, I feel the same challenge by my colleagues who are around me. They're constantly, I don't think any of us could get into any of these jobs, yourself, myself, anybody. It's extraordinary. I mean, I pinch myself that we actually have a position because I've heard so many fantastic clarinet players in the world that don't have jobs. Mm Mm-hmm that have tried and tried and don't know why they didn't get a job. And I, I, I don't have the answer for them because I mean, there are times when I go, well, I can't do what you do. I mean, right. that's amazing. You know, so luck and, and being at the right place at the right time, obviously having discipline, but never, I mean, the one thing I'll tell you, I just never think anything I do is decent enough. So I'm always, I'm, I'm going to criticize myself first and foremost before anybody else. If something doesn't go wrong or go right, it's, it's my fault. So I think that that's, that's sort of a testament to who we all should be. I think we all want to be better, but collectively we make each other better. Yeah. When the attitude is right, it's unbelievable. It's such a powerful, that's why, I mean, it, it's, uh, being a, a citizen of an orchestra is an honor. Like if everybody believes so much in the unified presentation of, of this great repertoire, it's it's just an honor to be able to be a part of it. So, one hundred percent, I I agree with everything you said, and I like that you said um, it's not about the praise or the accolades, but for for me, and I know for you, it's about if it's if it's not for anyone, it's, it's certainly not for ourselves. I, it's always for our colleagues, you know, yeah. and and and, tr- and then uh, transitively for the audience, and, and that's you're just constantly trying to be better for everyone else around you. Right. And I mean, who, when is there ever a time when we're playing where you don't feel that sense of, there's a sense of fear all the time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not fearless. Are you kidding me? I do know some musicians who are, and I'm so envious of the ones that are, but for me, I'm always uh, slightly afraid that I'm not going to 
rise to the occasion. So I don't want to let my colleagues down and I feel support from them and from the audience. I can feel it. Like they know, like they're, I could feel them rooting for me or cheering us on. And you just feel so, so empowered, uh, to do better. So yeah, I feel the same way. Terrific. Um, so we do have one, uh, I do have one last question for you. And this is actually from, uh, one of my listeners and, uh, this person wanted to know what is one thing that you learned about music or life that was most impactful to you? Um, whew, wow. Music and life. Well, I think that learning to, um, embrace life as much as you possibly can outside of the instrument is truly what's going to bring you to a whole nother level of the enrichment of the human spirit, which is why we are musicians in the first place. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, obviously being a father and having, I have three boys and, uh, you know, uh, the 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 love that you feel when you bring a, a life into this world and and you're nurturing them and you feel that unconditional love it could be you don't even have to have a child you could have a pet that unconditional love uh, that you feel from another being um, can and in so many ways inspire the way you want to be a musician uh, life experience sometimes the 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 pain the sorrow. Uh, the frustration, the anger, all of these emotions that we feel um, just naturally from just being a part of you know, your daily life. Something unexpected can happen that is tragic or something beautiful out of the blue comes out and, and, and just trying to be present. Because if you're present, I feel like you have an option, you have an opportunity to uh, experience it and convey that through the instrument. Because I... I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you play the clarinet, like for the same reason I play the clarinet. It's the only way that I know how to be a musician. It's it, it became my voice, so it's a way that I know how to express myself. So, and I've always told people this: like, I'm not going to play Beethoven's Sixth Symphony the same way twice. Mm -hmm. There comes a time when you know how to play it for an audition. You know your ideal version of it for that moment. But when you begin to perform these pieces on a regular basis. I hope I never play it the same way twice because I feel like I'm not doing justice to being in the moment. And I think that moment should be different every time because you are different every time. Right. I don't want to be a carbon copy of anybody, certainly not myself. And I just think that that's when you really are experiencing the living organism that an orchestra is with all of these different, you know, living beings around you experiencing something for the Hopefully, it should always feel like the first time. And I think that's tough. You know, I think that's tough it's to, to get into that place as much as possible. I mean, there are times when I'm not going to be able to do it, but I really want to be able to feel like I'm experiencing this great music for the first time in this person that I am at that moment. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that's great advice. I think I think that that person will uh, really appreciate you saying that. And we're all trying to live in the present as much as we can. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult, especially nowadays. But it is. Uh, try the best you can to just uh, experience whatever's around you, because in the end, that's what uh, creates the memories. So it's not the stuff you remember. It's not the stuff you're looking forward to. It's what's happening right now. It's hard um, to be present. Very yeah, difficult. Present. Uh, yeah, so, even in the tough times. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So before we leave, do you have any last words, shout outs, pieces of advice, or words of wisdom? Uh, if I had any words of wisdom as a clarinetist, I would say this. Um, to younger uh, aspiring clarinetists out there, um, don't be afraid to push the envelope with the uh, – and I'm not – I'm not, like I said, I'm not a hernia promoter, but I do find that with most young players today, um, that you, just because you're able to make a sound and have, you know, it feels good and you're able to get around the clarinet easily, doesn't necessarily mean you're giving your absolute best sound. And I think that that's the big test as an orchestral player is to learn how to play for larger halls. So I'm, I, I would encourage younger uh, clarinetists to push the envelope with 
embracing resistance a little bit more than you think you need to, because I think um, it, 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 you could have everything in the right place and at the right time. You play every note absolutely perfectly, but you may not have the kind of sound that is going to be um, welcomed in an orchestra. And I think that what ends up happening is that people don't realize that it's not just the effortless and effortlessness of playing. It's, it should be work. And in order to work, you have to actually have a cooperative resistance in the mouthpiece and your reed. Um, like I said, just because you can make a sound doesn't mean it's your best sound. And usually it takes more work than you think. But once you get on that trajectory, um, you'll know if you go too far in one direction or not far enough. But you, once you're on that trajectory, you will not believe the ability uh, of the things you can do on the instrument when you embrace this cooperative resistance with your airstream and, and, and the reed. I mean, and I know that there are people out there playing on plastic reeds, um, people that I love and respect. But I would encourage you to maybe reconsider. Uh, I'll keep trying them, but I've never been able to find a real reed. I've never been able to find a plastic reed that sounded better than a great cane reed. And so maybe I'm just crazy that way. Um, <laughs> that's the same me. way. And everybody, everybody's got to do what they've got to do. But I really just try not to jump on the bandwagon just because there are some great clarinetists that play plastic reeds. You have to understand that pretty much most of those players that are playing plastic reeds did not win auditions playing on plastic reeds. Think about it. So be careful. It can be a slippery slope. And I think it's really important that part of being a um, reed player is to embrace what it means to know how to make a reed, how to adjust a reed, how to um, find consistency in reed making, because I still feel like it's the best sound we can make on the instrument, personally. Yeah. Well, that is great advice, Steve. And Thank you so much. Like I said before, it's it's an absolute honor to have you on. Uh, I, I admire you so much. And if anybody wants to hear Steve, uh, there's a brand new thing called I believe, CSO TV. Is that what it is? Yes, CSO TV. CSO TV. And they've been uh, recording and streaming uh, chamber music. So uh, lots of, I mean, I'm, before we got on here, you were telling me all the stuff coming up. There's Dvorak Serenade, Gounod, Petite Suite. Is that what it is? Yeah, Gano Petite Symphony's coming up, and Symphony. oh my gosh, I can't even remember what else we have coming, but uh, we've got a lot of stuff. Oh, I know that we, d we did the Mozart E-flat Serenade. I know I did a, a opening concert of just quintet music, Nielsen, Piazzolla, and Gershwin, but further down the line, there's the C minor Serenade, uh, eventually the Grand Partita we're going to be doing, so there's a, a, there's a lot of stuff coming, and as long as we're able to keep the COVID uh, numbers down... God willing, uh, we will continue to record and try to bring as much music to everybody as 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 often as we can. Absolutely, yeah. So check it out, CSO TV. And Steve, what a what a fantastic episode! You are you're a tremendous guest. You have lots of great advice, and uh, I think people should probably heed your advice, considering the fact that you've been principal clarinet of three of the best orchestras in the world. So I think uh, if, if anyone's listening to this episode, I think you should definitely uh, listen to what this guy has to say. He seems to know what he's talking about. So um, for our new listeners out there, please make sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram at The Candy Clarinetist, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash The Candy Clarinetist. For links to all of these things, as well as information about myself and the podcast, visit candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, I am Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning in to The Candid Clarinetist Podcast.